Good morning, Catalyst. Getting close to Christmas, talking about miracles. I see y'all showing up with coffee. Hope you're ready to go today because I'm ready to go today. We're going to have a little fun. Uh, one of these quotes that I've run across this past week as I was preparing is, when I was young, I had, thank you, I admired clever people, and now that I am old, I admire kind people. Yeah, right? Like, man. Like, when I was younger, like, you know, when you're younger, you think, like, when I get older, I'm going to be in charge of stuff, and I'm going to be rich, and I'm, you know, I'm going to have a great car and houses and this. Like, you never think about being kind. Your parents are looking at you thinking, I don't care about the cars, I don't care about the houses, I don't care about the... Could, could they just be nice to people? If they could just be nice to people, that would be the goal. And, and the older I get and the more unkind people that I run into... Like when you run into somebody who really is truly kind, like from the heart, kind, you're like, man, I, j I just want to spend more time around that person. Th there's something special about kind people these days. I wish it wasn't so, but, but it is sort of where we're living these days that kind people just aren't everyday people. You got to hold on to them when you get them. And today, as we, as we finish up our miracle series, we're going to be talking about somebody who was built on or built in maybe that culture where, where they were just kind, where there was just something more about this man. And we're going to take a little look at him today as we talk about this. In week number one, we talked about everyone needs a miracle. Some miracles are immediate and some of them give you strength to stand up under the pressure that you're on right now. You're like, there's no way we can handle this. There's no way we can get through this. There's no way, and you do. And it's by God's power that you're able to get through that. And then last week, Josh talked about miracles delayed are not miracles denied. God, I just need something. I need it right now. And you're just pouring out your heart to God, and I need it, and I need it. And, and that doesn't mean that God isn't working upstream somewhere and has just the right time for you, and you think the right time is right now, but he knows the future, and he knows you, and he knows me, and he knows what the right time actually is. Today, what we're going to talk about is everyday miracles, miracles that we overlook, miracles that we attribute to maybe a million other things, but there's no way that's actually miraculous. But maybe they actually are if we will leave some room for God to work still, rather than making everything intellectual and everything this, everything has to fit together and two plus two always has to equal four. Maybe sometimes it doesn't. Maybe sometimes there's a little extra that God puts in that you're like, this just doesn't make sense. And maybe we're going to leave a room for a little bit of that today. But as we get into scripture here, there, there are three questions that as you study your Bibles... And I'm just going to say, I believe that all of you are reading and studying your Bibles because that helps to follow Jesus more, right? Like, let's just go ahead and say, yes, we're all doing that. You aren't fooling me, but you know, it doesn't matter what I think. So here are three questions that if you answer these three questions, you will understand scripture better. You will feel like, oh, I need to keep reading this because I'm actually getting something out of it. And you will, like, my life has changed because, because I have come in contact with God's word. And the first one is, what did it mean to them? What did it mean to them? What did it mean that, that David was walking out in the wilderness? What did it mean when, when uh, Moses was, the, again, in the wilderness, and the wilderness was actually desert, and they were, they were wandering for 40 years in a country that is smaller than North Carolina? Like, how do you wander for 40 years in a certain part of that that is desert? Like, there's something else going on there. And I'm getting, I, they're getting frustrated because they keep running past the same places. And do you trust your leader anymore? Like he keeps being us back by the same place. And, and I don't know that I trust him and we're not moving how I want to or where I want to. And he's just following God, trying the best that he can because he's frustrated too, saying, God, I've seen that rock four other times. I'm tired of running through this valley. I'm tired of running through this wadi. I'm tired of running through. And God says, just stay close to me. Like there are times in our lives that we have to understand what scripture said to them. And when we understand what it said to them, then we ask the question, what does it mean to me? 
Because I am not King David. I am not Moses. I am not Abraham. But the way that God handled Abraham sure lines up pretty closely with what God's got going on with me a lot of times in my life. So what he says to Abraham so often applies just so foundationally to me that I've got to get this right. But I have to understand Abraham and I have to understand that time period so that I can understand what Scripture is saying to me. And then what most Christians are doing these days are they are just saying, okay, that's great. I'm a great mature Christian now because I know these things. And it never makes it into the actions of their lives. People look at Christians and say they don't live any differently than we do. Why? Because we don't. Because what we know, what we read, what we encounter does not actually make its way into how we live daily. And that's where the problem is. That's where the problem is. So if you, if you ask these three questions, if you can find answers to these three questions every time you read, every time you listen, every time you walk away from a sermon like this, a small group, whatever it might be, then you will actually be moving your faith forward. So I want you to ask these questions and apply these questions to you as we get in here. We are at the Christmas season, Christmas, Christmas, whatever it is. We are at that season and we are going to look at Matthew chapter 1 today and we're going to sort of break it down into pieces and maybe discover a few things that we haven't seen before. So in Matthew chapter 1, starting in verse 18, it says, this is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded, and he took Mary home as his wife. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then we'll jump into this. Father God, I ask you, Lord, to open our hearts and our minds to what you are doing. That when people leave today, they think that somehow or another, I know what's going on in their lives, but we know it's you that are speaking to them. I ask you, Lord, to just open our hearts and minds. Spirit, run through here and just teach us and show us and move us forward in our faith. It's your son's name I pray. Amen. So as you're a preacher, one of the things you run into, and they're never planned, obviously, right, is a death in the family. And we have had a death here at Catalyst. Uh, Hendrik Madsula has died. Now, some of you might not have, probably a lot of you didn't know him. Hendrik's been around for about 10 years. But he's one of those real quiet guys that as a group is talking, he walks behind you and walks on in and then walks on back out. But uh, Hendrik has passed this week from cancer, and we are happy that he is happy in heaven, and, uh, but the family is struggling a little bit right now. If you know, if you know Rudy or Peggy, um, Rudy is more of the o most outspoken of the family. Uh, they're going through this right now, and they've got family and friends in from from the Netherlands and from Suriname and from Florida and South Carolina and just all over the place. But one of the things that I get to do, one of the privileges I get is when, when somebody passes, I want to know, if they want me to do the funeral, I want to know more about them. So I come and say, tell me stories. Tell me stories about them. Because Hendrik, I've only known the last 10 years of his life, and I've really only known him in like on Sunday morning saying hi when he's really quiet and you're trying to hear him, but he's so quiet that it's like sort of hard, but he's got this little smile on his face like he's about to get into trouble, so I need to keep an eye on him. He's one of those guys. So I was over there Wednesday night and they were telling me about all these different stories about Hendrick and how, you know, uh, you know, he was good at different things. They came, you know, Hendrick grew up in Suriname. His father was a slave brought over from the Netherlands to there. And as we're sitting there and they're telling me all of these stories, one of the stories, one of the questions I like to ask everybody, not just when you're at, you know, somebody has passed is, 
tell me how you and your wife or you and your husband met. And I mean the real story. Not like, let's, let's sanitize it because we're talking to the preacher and let's take out all of the real stuff that really matters and let's give this cool, fit, you know, fits here picture. So a, as I ask this question to Pawnee, and now Pawnee is, this is, this is here's Hendrick, and this is Pawnee, this is uh, um, Peggy, their daughter, and then their grandsons, this is a while ago, they, they do not look like this anymore. She looks exactly like that still. Um, but um, I look at Pawnee and I'm like, so tell me, how did you guys meet? And she's also just very quiet, and she gets this grin on her face, and I'm like, oh, this is going to be a good one, right? So, so then we're there, and so Hendrick's got one of his sisters there. He's one of 12 brothers and sisters. He's got one of his sisters there, one of his brothers there, sort of one of his adopted sons there that he did a lot. He brought in a lot of people and made them family, and then, um, then actually his daughter and his son, and, and, and I'm, I'm like, okay, so Pawnee has this grin on her face, and she, she starts to sort of tell, but... English is at least her second language. She speaks Dutch as her primary language. And there are all Dutch speakers there, except for me. Um, so they like, they're trying to like figure out how do we tell this story and all this Dutch is going on. I'm, I guess it's Dutch. I don't know. I didn't understand it. I'm saying it's Dutch. So they're sitting there and they're telling, and then the story starts to come out. In Suriname, uh, your neighbors became like family. Unlike here in the United States, you pull in the driveway, you walk through the car, uh, you walk through the garage, and you walk in, and you never, like, I don't know anything about my neighbors. In Suriname, you depended on your neighbors. Like, like you had to know them. So Hendrick's family was, was 12 brothers and sisters, and he was sent off to live with his uncle, like happened a ton in the United States back when you needed all of the hands to get all of the work done. That still was happening in Suriname. So he was sent off to live with his uncle and grew up next to this family who had 10 brothers and sisters also. Um, and because they were there, and one of the things that happens in Suriname is, is nobody has a mortgage. Amen. Like, like, I'm all excited about that, right? Like, but it might take them 12 to 15 years to build their house. Because every Saturday... It's like we're going to Scott's house and we're finishing up the wiring and the drywall and the, and, and the community shows up and, and you work and then you go home and, and then you come back next Saturday either to Scott's house or to somebody else's house and you, and you just do this and you pay as you've got money and you go along. Now Suriname is also the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere right behind Haiti that is all over the news all the time. How many of you before now have heard of Suriname? Exactly. Like with just three hands, maybe. So it just, it just, it's not there. So what they did is, is they always, Pawnee and, and Hendrick always sort of knew each other because they grew up next to each other. And then it's time to get a job as Hendrick gets older and Hendrick goes off to the capital city and gets this job and he comes back on these vacations. Now there's not really vacations for them. It's like, I'm not working for them. I'm now working here. Because, you know, on Saturday, they go work all day long at somebody's house, right? Like, there weren't really vacations. It was like, I'm being paid by somebody different, or I'm not being paid. But he would go back home for these vacations, these week-long things, and, and his family might not see him as much as, as much as they expected. Sort of like when your kids come home from college, and it's like, oh, I'm going to see them. It's going to be great. And then all of a sudden, it's like, they're with their friends. All the I, where did they go? Why are they not with me? Well, Hendrick happened to be hanging out with this pretty little neighbor girl. And they discovered that he was hanging out with this pretty near little neighbor girl quite a bit. And it had been developing over the last year. And uh, Pawnee's uh, father and mother found out. So mom and dad, the rest of the kids come to Pawnee's work. And she's working there and she sees the family show up. And if all of your family shows up to your work, you're thinking, okay, something's wrong. Um, they show up and they're like, you've been dating Hendrick. And she gets this sly little look on her face like, oh boy. And they're like, that's who you're going to marry. Arranged marriages still happen today, people. Pawnee and Hendrick had an arranged marriage. Peggy and Rudy, who you will see running around here today, this same thing happened and they had an arranged marriage. Now, if you know anything about arranged marriages, they last about like 95% of the time as compared to the 50% that those of us here in the United States get, right? So, so they had this arranged marriage and they lived and they loved and they moved from Suriname to the United States and started all over again and, and all of these different things. But these arranged marriages are pretty powerful. Now, let me say I'm a fan of arranged marriages. 
Uh, Holly has actively started trying to arrange a marriage between Bella and another child uh, that is here in the church. Um, the parents have begun talking. We don't know if the kids are involved yet or not. We don't believe they are. Um, but we're pretty excited about uh, this idea. Um, so I'm going to like quote scripture at her and show her how it works. Uh, let's see how that goes. Um, but one of the things in our culture... Like, this doesn't happen. Why doesn't this not happen? Because you're looking for the one. Oh, the one that just completes me. The one that just satisfies my soul. The one that, that picks up where I leave off and we complete each other's sentences. And do you find those stories, those, the, all the movies that we see that are just like, oh, and like I see people that are like, it was the best movie. I cried the whole way through. I'm like, that's sick. You've got issues. Like, I, I don't want to cry the whole way through. And if I do, I'm not recommending that movie. Like, I'm not telling anybody about that, right? So, but when we look at Scripture, how many stories, like, they found the one that you see? The answer is zero. There are not these stories in there. One, because there were arranged marriages. Two, because they had different expectations for marriage. God completed them. They never expected their spouse to complete them, and that's probably why we struggle in our marriages the way that we do, is they're not satisfying my wants and my desires and my needs. Well, they're not supposed to. God's supposed to, first of all. Second of all, when they look for people, they look for somebody who would be a good mother, somebody who would help them build their family line, another 10, 12 kids or whatever it might be, somebody who, who, who was smart, somebody who made good decisions, you know, they, they, you know, you always hear, I remember growing up, is like, if you want to find out what the girl's going to be like, look at her mom. How does she act? How does she look? How does she whatever? And I always just applied that to how she looked. I was like, oh, mama's good looking. So, you know, you're like, well, we need to go talk to her a little bit more. But they took it a little bit more. It's like, how was she raising children? How, how does she take care of the house? How does she... And if mama's crazy... I'm going to leave it right there because I know some of you are sitting next to your spouses right now and I, I see looks being given, so I'm just going to leave that one right there. But that's not what happened in Scripture, right? But let's get back into your Scripture and let's point out a couple of things that I, that I think we could miss as we've gone through this story over these years. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged, arranged, to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. They had an arranged marriage. There were basically three parts to any marriage that you'll see in Scripture. There is the dowry, which is the most important part. I, I am all but selling. You are buying my daughter from me. I have to give you money so that you will take her out of my house. Please take her. The bigger the dowry is, the more likely you were, you were to get rid of her, which seems crazy. But if you look in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, they talk about you have to give them a certificate of divorce. It's like this sale was voided. It's like that's sort of what this is. It's a very important part of this. This is why brides still today, their families pay for most of the weddings. It comes from all the way back then. Then you would have this year-long betrothal. We might call it engagement. It was this betrothal period. And during this betrothal period, you were married, but the wife still lived with her family. So there was nothing physical going on for a year, nothing. Yet Mary comes to Joseph and says, um, we need to have a talk. And Joseph sees the look in her face and is like, oh, this is not going to be good. Could you imagine having to be Mary and, and go have this talk? Could you imagine being Joseph and having your wife? And she comes and she says, I'm pregnant. And he's like, I'm noticing. <laughs> She's like, it's not yours. He was like, no kidding. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't miss that, right? Like, I picked up on that. So then the next question is, so whose is it? Could you imagine the betrayal that Joseph felt at this point? And how scared and the tension that was going on from Mary's side, like, uh, I'm pregnant but the Holy Spirit's baby? Uh, like, imagine this talk that's going on at this point, and Joseph's like, liar! Like, you are, why are you lying? Just tell me the truth. Stop your lying, and let's figure this thing out. So one of, I think, the everyday miracles that we find in this story that, that we've missed a million times is Joseph was hurt, but he didn't hurt Mary in return. 
I mean hurt, rock to the foundations hurt. I am completely committed to you emotionally and spiritually. And you've taken that and, and tried giving that away to somebody else? Like, I'm, I'm done. I'm, I'm undone. I'm like, imagine the tension that happens. Don't you want to get back at them? Don't you have this spite, this anger that's just building up from within is like, I'm posting it on Facebook. I'm telling all of my, I'm letting them know I didn't do anything wrong. We're not married because of you, not because of me, but because of you. I'm telling everybody, I'm putting it on billboards, Facebook, Instagram, Snap, all the above. Everybody's hearing that it was you. I don't want to mess up not only myself, but I don't want to mess up my family name. The halters don't do stuff like that. And, and I don't want you to bring that against me, my uncles, my father, my grandfather. All of a sudden, everything is set up differently. But Joseph says, I'm not going to do that. Now, imagine this talk. Why is it so hard to have this talk, right? So, so the Jews have been expecting the Messiah to show up for thousands of years. They've been talking about it. They celebrate it. They, it's in their festivals. It's in their weekly commitment. It's in their prayers. It's in everything. So when Mary comes to Joseph and says, I am pregnant through the Holy Spirit, why isn't he like, woo, come on. Like, I'm all kinds of excited. I get to be the stepdad to the Messiah. Because it sounds crazy, right? Like, that's just like... Ooh, ooh, like uh, something's wrong here. But don't we believe that Jesus is going to come back one day for his bride? That Jesus is going to come and he's going to get you and he's going to get me and everybody else who's still alive and he's going to take us to heaven. Isn't that what we believe? Yet what if somebody came to you and you talked to them in a restaurant, at work, whatever it might be, and they said, I am Jesus. Uh, excuse me, mental health department, do you have any beds right now? Uh, please, can you go ahead and come on over here? Because they've got delusions of grandeur. Like, no one's believing this. Yet we, we say we believe it? Why is this such a hard thing to believe when we, when we are looking forward to it in the bad times? We are just, we know that Jesus is coming back, but he doesn't look like you? Like, I don't know, like... They were dealing with that exact same thing. Because for 425 years, we think like when we read scripture, especially in the New Testament, but when we read this, Malachi stops the Old Testament. For 425 years, God does not speak. It is not recorded. And then things begin to happen. Mary and Joseph are essentially sitting in the same seats that we are. How many people have had God speak, have heard a prophet actually prophesy something happening and it actually happened? Like it's obviously our scientific, scientific Western minds say that there's no way that could happen, but we hope it will. See, Joseph had two options. It was to take her to court and to expose her in front of everyone or divorce her quietly. And, and for whatever reason, Joseph decided to see a second miracle, and Joseph trusted the supernatural to make a decision. He trusted the supernatural that showed up in a dream. How many of us are doing stuff like that? But it says... This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had a mind to divorce her quietly. I would, I would say that Joseph was not just a letter of the law kind of guy. Joseph here was a heart of the law kind of guy. He didn't just read the scripture to argue with people. He didn't just read the scripture to intellectually have a foundation to understand these things. He read the scripture to understand the heart of God, to develop, let the scripture develop his heart into the same as that of God's. Because nobody else is doing this. Nobody else 
is, is believing that his wife is pregnant, has a dream and decides, yeah, that seems right. Let's go ahead and do that. Let's believe that dream. But he was faithful to the law. And I've got to believe that changed everything for him. But after he had considered this, notice, he was faithful to the law. He decided to give her a divorce quietly. And then, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He had to take a step before the supernatural showed up. God, just give me a sign. Just show me what you want to do. And he was like, how about you step out first? The Jewish people do not believe that when Moses was used by God to part the Red Sea, that he did it with dry feet. If you read any stories, any biblical understanding of what happened there, Moses walked out and he was neck deep with his staff above his head before those waters parted. How much do you have to trust God is just like, he said he's going to do it. He said he's going to do it. He said, I'm going to keep stepping. I'm just going to keep stepping until he does this. See, what we want is the easy way out. We want God to show up first, and then I'll do whatever you want me to do. He's like, it don't work that way. How about you take that step in faith first and watch what I do with it? Come on. Come on. This is what God is trying to do with you. Some of you, God is saying, you're saying, God, just show up. And he's like, just take the step. Come on. See, we have these miracles that we want in our lives, but we miss them. We miss them. And why do we miss them? Because we're looking in the wrong places or we're overlooking them. In Acts chapter 2, we see here in Acts chapter 2, Jesus has just gone to heaven. Peter has just got up and, and, he's, and he's going ahead and he's telling everybody and reminding them, you've been looking for this Messiah. You've been waiting for this Messiah. He was just here. You did not believe him. You killed him. And here is where we are. And we see in Acts chapter 2 verse 17, he quotes he quotes Joel here, and he says, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit, the capital S, the Holy Spirit. I will pull out my spirit on all of my people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. And it started happening there in Acts chapter 2. Go home and pick up your Bible. Start reading Acts chapter 2 and start showing all of this stuff start happening in the Holy Spirit. The day of Pentecost happens right there. See what starts happening here. But we think that those things don't happen. That's, that's a good story. I'm glad the Bible tells us those stories. The short one here, Chris, is our missionary that we support, that you guys support. And he's over in Bosnia. And he sees a few things that maybe we don't see. Greetings, Catalyst. Uh, this is Chris Vilwak, uh, and this is my teammate, whose also name is Chris, and we're coming to you uh, from Banja Luka, Bosnia. Um, and Scott is talking to you guys about different ways that God works in the world, and Chris here uh, has a pretty cool story that he is going to share with you. One of the ways God's working here in Bosnia is actually uh, Jesus is coming to people in dreams. Out of the ordinary for me, but uh, multiple people have told me stories. One in particular, met a young man, uh, doing a park cleanup project, went to pick him up to take him to a doctor's appointment. And that was the day I was going to give him a Bible. I had the Bible in the back seat of the car. Pick him up. He gets in the car and he says, hey, Chris, I had a dream about you last night. Oh, yeah? What was the dream? He said, I dreamt that today you gave me a book. Okay. I turned around and says, is that the book? And he looked at it and he said, that's it. So that night he read uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. The very next day he got uh, clear through Romans um, about... Six months later, he was baptized into the kingdom. So God's working in dreams. So uh, please pray that he would continue to do so, that Jesus would come to more and more people uh, and, and reveal himself. Yeah. Thank you. And there's one more story uh, with uh, one of your coworkers. Why don't yes. you share that with them as well? Yes. Um, uh, here in Bosnia, a lot of times uh, people will get to that point where they, they're ready to say yes to Jesus, but they hit this, this barrier Sometimes they go away, sometimes we don't hear from them for, for, for a while. This young lady, she heard the gospel lots of times, gotten to that point, uh, but just wasn't ready to make that decision. One night, she had a dream. In that dream, there were six doors, uh, or six or seven doors. All of them were closed except for the one in the middle, opens up, there's a bright light behind it. 
and a voice comes and says, go through this door, there will be somebody to, to, to guide you to truth, and then my colleague shows up on that, on that door. In the dream. In the dream. Shows up in that door. Yes. Yeah. And so the next day she, she called my colleague, Amber, and says, I'm ready for you to show me the truth. Um, and then again, she was baptized uh, a short time later. So, dreams. Miracles are happening. Come on, we can go ahead and let's celebrate now. That, like he's able to be over there and be able to tell us these stories because of your support. Like this is happening. You'll notice like in the, in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, when God wants to start doing something, he sort of like winds things up a little bit. And, and all of a sudden miracles start happening and dreams start happening and, and these people are starting being healed. And like there's these things that start happening and that he gives us a hint that something big's coming. In Bosnia, something big is coming. They see it because they know of the dreams. Because they know during Ramadan, hundreds of Muslim people were having dreams about the man, the man in the, uh, uh, what is it they're saying? The man in the, what's that? Sandals, thank you. That would have been a whole bunch better if I'd have got it right the first time. Man. All of them are having dreams about a man in the sandals. And then somebody shows them a picture of Jesus like, that's the man I've been dreaming about. It's happening. It's happening in different places, and maybe it's happening in your life, and you don't even recognize it. How many times you're like, I had this dream, and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to do what the dream said to do. I'm going to believe that dream. I'm going to believe that God is the one who gave me that dream. Mm -mm. Now, that, that's crazy talk here in the United States. That, that doesn't make any sense. Therefore, it cannot happen. We're talking miracles here, people. We're talking miracles. But let me just say, I believe that those dreams came to him, that the Holy Spirit came to Joseph, that, that God was doing special things. But I also believe that Joseph went and asked a few trusted people. Joseph went and said, I was like, Dad, what, what do you do here, Dad? Like, I don't, Mom, come on. Like, what, what am I supposed to do? Mary's pregnant. We all know, like, I believe God uses so many different things. So when you have tough decisions in your life, when God is asking you to step out and to do just like unrealistic things, here are a couple of things that I would say, try these things as you go along. First of all, ask yourself, does it line up with scripture? God's telling me I need to divorce my wife or husband and I need to go over here. No, he's not. No, he is not. There are other supernatural beings that are trying to direct you in a direction away from God. So you need to recognize this. You need to check this with Scripture. Does it line up with Scripture? Second, does it line up with what God has already been doing with me? Normally, normally, God is not going to take a hard left. He created you with your strengths, with your weaknesses, with the people around you, with your skill set, with all of the above, because he has you designed for something specific. So if you're like, I would hate to do that, then don't. I believe God made you to do the things that you like to do and be really good at them. Now, we all need to do things that, you know, maybe sometimes are rough to do, but God designed you a certain way for a certain reason. Three, what do my mature, I cannot emphasize this enough, mature Christian friends say about this? Now, let me define mature. It's not somebody who knows scripture. It's not somebody who spent the last 20 years in, in a church. Satan knows more scripture than anybody and is probably in church more than anybody. So we need to recognize this. Who has sacrificed for the kingdom? Who has put themselves second and the kingdom first? For years. For years. I have discipled people for 5, 10, 30 years. Like, but what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be a preacher? No. Jesus calls us to disciple people. Like, that's the highest level of leadership in a church. Like, disciple people for a long period of time. That's the goal. But you've got to find those people and say, man, I don't know. Like, this is happening to me, and I don't know what God wants me to do. And you find these people who have sacrificed for the kingdom, who have put themselves second, and put the kingdom and God and the church and whoever first, and ask them these questions. And then, is God providing supernatural signs, some chance encounters. I, I couldn't believe I was asking God, and then like I met this person the next day, or I had this job opportunity this next day, and I, like, what am I supposed to do? Come on, you've been praying about an answer. He gave you, he sent you a person. He gave you a dream, whatever it might be. Come on, let's get these things right. 
Don't overlook these everyday miracles that are happening everywhere in the world, are happening in Scripture, and are probably happening in our lives, and we just overlook them because they don't make sense. Two plus two doesn't equal four. Sometimes it doesn't. If you leave a little room for God, he wants to do a little something extra. Maybe it doesn't equal four anymore. Maybe he's got a little something extra he wants to put on top there. You see, we're here at Christmas time and we, we're talking about miracles. Everyday miracles, supernatural miracles, all of the above. But what is Christmas about? It's not about gifts. It's not even actually about miracles. It is about Jesus coming down from heaven. About him living, which I think is the harder part than dying And rising again so that you and I could have a relationship with him. So I want to do this here at Christmas. I don't think we can overlook this. There are some of you here today who maybe haven't taken all the steps to following Jesus the way you need to follow him. And I want to make clear what the gospel says about this. Now, I believe there are probably many places you could go in scripture to find out what does God want me to do to find out if I'm a Christian, am I following Jesus? I always go to Acts 2.37 and 38. And the reason is because I heard a dumb story about a preacher who said he thought these scriptures were so important that he was going to have them in every sermon, every year, all year long, 52 times. And he told a story about there's a, somebody who wanted to date his daughter, and he went and got his 238s and was going, to take an act, and was going to act on it. I was like, that maybe is the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life, but it stuck. So I go to Acts 2.37 and 38, and it says, when the people heard this, what Peter had to say, reminding them of them waiting on the Messiah, reminding them of Jesus showing up and everything that Jesus had done and them killing him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what do we do? I, I need to do something about what I just heard. What do we do? And Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. There are three things here that I think Scripture shows us in this that we need to do. First of all, they believed. People were cut to the heart and said, I've got to do something. Other people were like, what's for lunch? And those people went and had lunch. But the people who believed that Jesus was who Peter said, said, I have got to take action on this. What am I supposed to do? So they believed If you don't believe, there's no reason to take any other steps. If you are here today and you believe that, the next step is they repented. They repented. The Jewish understanding of this is to get back on the path to God. Get back on the path, but I've sinned. Yeah, I don't care. Get back on the path to God. But I've gone too far. Then turn around and get back on the path to God. But you don't know what I've done. Then get back on the path to God. So some of you need to believe. Some of you have. Some of you need to repent, and some of you are repenting. And then they confess Jesus as their Savior through baptism. This is one of those things when you see it done, you're like, I I can see what's happening there. They're saying in front of everybody, here is the exclamation point to my faith. And you need to know this. And, And maybe you need to know it and see me do it, and maybe I just need to do it. If there are some of you who are here today, there's like, I haven't been baptized. I have not taken that step. I have not repented. I'm trying to figure out this belief. Those green connection cards that we give you in every one of your bulletins, those green connection cards, flip that thing over on the back and say, I'd like to learn about following Jesus. I'd like to learn about baptism, about about, uh, repenting or believing or whatever it is, and we will get in contact with you because this is what Christmas is about, is about introducing people to Jesus. He came so that people could know him and experience him. And here at Catalyst, we want to introduce the world to the real Jesus one person at a time. And we've got to do that when we're together, when we're apart, through the missionaries that we support, whatever it might be. Christmas is the birth of Jesus, and it can be the spiritual birth for many of you here today if you decide to take that step. Put it on the back of your connection cards, and I want to see what God has to do with you the miracles he wants to do in you, through you, around you, if you just give him some room.